I'm Steve. Welcome to Woodworking Masterclass and welcome to my shed. What we're doing this season is making two boxes. One is a plywood box with veneer and solid timber edging and the other is a solid timber box with a raised panel lid. So far we've made the boxes, we've cut the lids off, covered up the unsightly uh, plywood that you see. It's starting to look pretty reasonable actually. This one we fitted the hinges last episode and it's ready to be lined. And this stand, I haven't attached to the box yet, but you can tell it's a little bit different to this. So we've got two different styles of box. What I want to do now is share with you how to line your boxes. And I'll show you two ways. The first way is with the ply box, which you'll notice hasn't got hinges. We'll have a fitted lid with that, and that'll be lined with timber. And this one will line with fabric. Okay, let's go. What I've done, I've already machined up some uh, lengths of cedar, that's uh, Spanish cedar. Now, I've got to cut these to size. So what you do is you measure in about a millimetre under what the sizes are for the box. And that'll be your base and your lid. And I'll also cut some up for sides. Seeing this doesn't have hinges, we're going to use the infill of the box to act as the locking mechanism for the lid. So what I have to do is measure Put my glasses on so I can see. Measure how deep the box is. And that's 40, 53 mil deep. Now I want a lip of about three or four mil to protrude from that box so the lid can sit on it. And I also want very, very small amount of sticking to go in there to give it a nice seal. So with my bandsaw set up, what I'll do is rip a couple of pieces to go inside here. Look at that. Typical. I want to use the machine, the dog's in front of it. You're right Bob, I'm not annoying you am I? Good on you mate. Now it's just a question of putting that in and I've just just got enough lip hanging over the edge for the top to be secured by. What I want to do is just plane that rough edge off. So have a look at the grain direction. Squirt of water in the vise. For those of you who missed that, that stops things slipping in the vise. Cheapest shop aid you'll ever get. Let's use my little plane. Just dress this off. Just a smidgen of this end, I think. There we have it. Do that to all four pieces and then cut mitres. I've already done that on these ones to give you an idea of how it slots in together. Now that I actually did not on my trusty hand saw, but I did that on a docking saw. But before you fit the sides, I've got ahead of myself, cut one of these bits almost down to the size of the box, but leave about a mil clearance all the way around, which I've done with this one. And if you see when it goes in, it just floats down to the bottom quite nicely. And then pop them in place. a nice tight fit. Now the lid fit nicely on top. But just to finish it off, we'll also put a base on the inside, which I've cut to size. It goes in there like that. And I've got some really fine bits of sticking that'll hold that in place. Just being hard to get along with this bit, isn't it? There we go. And there you have it. Two boxes nicely lined. If you want, you can just run your plane 
right along the edge and take a very, very slight chamfer off or you can use sandpaper. Make sure we get that the right way around. And that's one box finished. All we have to do now is put the finishing coats on it and a bit of polish and it's ready to go. Next, we'll do the lining of the other box and with that one I'm going to use material. So please come back after the break and we'll have some fun. See you then. Hi, welcome back. Well, as I said, just before the break, I've got something a bit special for you. And it's a break from mainline woodworking, but it shows how much fun you can have with a box. I was making a lot of these at one stage, and then I got into making a few other bits and pieces, and I met a guy the other day who said he could play any musical instrument. So within an hour, I changed a box into what they call a diddly bow, a one-stringed instrument. And if you really want a bit of a challenge, and you've got something, nothing to do for an afternoon, 2B1 and a cigar box. Look what you can make with a bit of imagination and a little bit of wood. I'd like to uh, change over now and introduce you to Justin Johnson, and he's gonna play these musical instruments. And after the break, we'll get back and finish these boxes off. So please enjoy this little excursion into musical wonderland. See you soon. G'day. As I said back in the workshop, I met uh, Justin Johnson, oh, I think it was two days ago, at a blues festival called Get Rooted uh, up here in Brisbane, and he was playing the most amazing instruments. Afterwards, I was talking to Justin, and I said, mate, you could play anything. He said, you make me a box with a stick, and he said, and I'll get a tune out of it. And, uh, well, Justin, I took you up on your offer. There's a box that I sort of stuffed up, and I've thrown a stick in it, so... Uh, I'll take you on your word. If you can get a tune out of that, I'll be one awfully impressed guy. And I was going to say, I think it's done with Smoke and Mirrors, but that's the name of your new album too, isn't it? It is. So there's a free plug. Look for Justin's new album, Smoke and Mirrors. Justin, I'll leave you with it, and uh, catch you later. Well, uh, like Steve said, a lot of times all you need is just a string, a stick, and a box. And there's a long tradition in Roots music of Musicians starting out on instruments just like these. Uh, this is in America, it's called a one string diddly bow. And you play it, it doesn't have any frets to fret with. You don't actually hold your finger against the string. You play it with a slide like this uh, ceramic Rocky Mountain slide I've got right here. You pluck down here, just like a guitar. And when you want to change pitch, since you don't have frets, you put that slide against the string. As you can see, that's about all you need to make some music. Mate, that was brilliant. I'm Thank impressed. You. So there you go. If you've got any boxes that you're really going to throw away, just use your imagination and make something maybe for you to play with all the kids to play with. But if you're fair dinkum about music and you really want to get into it, get a cigar box or make your own box and you can make a full-blown electric guitar for far less than you'd ever imagine. Um, so, Justin, can I leave you with this and you could play, play us out the back of the show? Absolutely. That'd be wonderful. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Justin Johnson. <laughs>
to put the lining on the solid timber box and for that I'm going to use fabric. Now when we did the veneer box and we had the solid timber lining that meant that we had to put the base in first and then we put the lining boards around the edge of that. With fabric it's the other way around. First of all you put the fabric edging in and then you put the base in and that clears all the little um, gaps that you might otherwise see. So what you do is just an old cornflakes packet or any sort of cardboardy packet. Now the shape I've cut out is the size of the box with the sides already in there minus two thicknesses of the fabric that we're using and whatever that measurement comes up that's how I cut this. So when I put this in it's a fairly loose fit. You can see how loose that is? And the reason for being at loose fit is when we put the fabric in and fold it over, it's actually going to fill it up. The other thing I use is double-sided tape. A lot of craft shops sell this. I'm not sure what the name is. This is a, a Japanese brand name. Very, very thin and very, very strong. So what you do is put it on the shiny side of the cardboard. And what we actually do is roll the edges of the fabric over and stick it on. Now once that's all in place, cut a piece of fabric. This is velour. Oversized, about an inch, three quarters of an inch oversized. Then I just use a spray adhesive, which you're meant to use in a well ventilated area. So not only I suffer, but the whole production crew can suck in that. It's lovely. And then the back of the fabric. This is just a, a craft when you pick up a local hardware shop. Lay the fabric down. I, I make sure that it's the absorbent side of the cardboard goes down, not the glossy side because it doesn't stick. I've got double-sided tape put around here, which I'll release in a minute. And I actually stole these from my wife's sewing room and I was so impressed with them I bought myself one because if you're doing box lining or drawer lining or the inside of doors, they're invaluable. This is a rotary cutter for fabric and this has got all the different degrees. Well, when I say I bought one, I don't really mean that. I mean my wife got sick of me pinching hers so she actually bought me one. So it was quite nice. 
So I lay that along there at 45 degrees and I come up about a mil or a mil and a half from the corner of the cardboard because what I want to do is have a bit of overlap when I fold this all together so we don't see any of the cardboard poking through on the corners. Got to work fairly quickly. Just gets a bit confusing sometimes when you got to work out which way the lines go. But if you've done a good project, it's worth taking the extra time to make sure it's finished well. And once you've cut the corners off, move the backing paper. Told you it was sticky. And then we roll the fabric onto the back side of the sticky paper. And pulling it tight as you go. Paying particular attention to the corners. We don't want any frays to show there. And then when that's all done, we turn it over and it's nice and square. Now that will fit very nice and tightly into the bottom. Push it down, tuck it down with your fingers. All the way around. There you have a nice line fabric box. Now this one I actually finished before I put the lining in and the reason for that is pretty obvious. I didn't want to get any stain or oil or wax onto the fabric inside the box. But I'll show you what I used and I'll show you how you can really make your boxes look old. <laughs> Right, now this is about the finishes of the box. With the veneer box, it was a fairly straightforward finish. You can spray it if you like with an acrylic or an enamel. And what I actually did with this was shellac. And you buy that in flake form. Most hardware shops sell it. Then it's just a matter of melting it down in metho or DAA alcohol, soft brush, and you brush it on. Give it many, many coats and then you rub it back and then recoat it. It is time consuming, but it does give you a lovely feel. And to finish it off, I just use a, a light brown wax. You could use a clear wax, but you can see the color of that. If I rub that in, and then rub it off, it doesn't really make the box look any darker, but it gives it a beautiful patina and a lovely feel. Now the solid timber one, that was slightly different. The stain I used on that was what they call Van Dyke crystals. And that's a powdered substance made out of walnut husks. It's soluble in water. They've been using it for hundreds of years. And I like it because the number of coats you put on really dictates how dark it's going to be. And I finished that with oil. I wouldn't use any shellac or stain over the top because it'll melt the color out. But just an ordinary um, oil, whether it's tongue oil, Danish oil, Scandinavian oil, there's a lot of brands around. Just pick one that suits you. And again, you brush it on or wipe it on with a rag, rub it in with really fine 4 row steel wool if you like. And when you get the finish you desire, leave it for a few days to harden. And then again, a wax. In this case, I used a darker wax and it gives it a lovely finish. But one little trick that you might want to experiment with, there's a range of waxes out called effects waxes. And what they do, they trick the eye. Now that's just like black tar, but it's a wax. And you don't put it all over your job. You just put it in the corners or where there's any defects or angles in your work. 
and then rub it out. And what it does, it leaves really nice dark edges, which is the same as hundreds and hundreds of years of dirt and grime and dust, which gives it a patina. So there you go, two boxes, both made in the same time frame. One's fairly contemporary, one's a bit traditional, but one looks new and one looks old. If you want to know more about boxes, there are a lot of great books on the market. Here's some people that I particularly like. Andrew Crawford has some wonderful books out. Uh, this is one, he's got another one called Boxes and another one Celebrating Boxes, which he did with Peter Lloyd, who's also got a book out called Heirloom Boxes. So you get some great ideas from them. If you're just starting out in box making, I really recommend this one, Doug Stowe's Box Making 101. It's got so many great ideas of how to make boxes, how to embellish them, and he's got some other books, so check him out online. Or if you just want a reference book, this is one of my favourite in the library, and it just has hundreds and hundreds of beautiful coloured plates of different boxes, whether they're ivory, whether they're timber, whether they're brass, tortoise shell, and it just gives inspiration. So be about it, start making some boxes. They don't take too much material, and if you mess them up, it doesn't matter. Start again. And if you do have a couple you have messed up, remember, why not try turning it into a musical instrument? Well, it's Steve pulling the shed door down for yet another season and saying thank you for your company, and I really look forward to seeing you next season where we're making a wall-mounted or stand-mounted cabinet. But until then, remember to keep it sharp, and more importantly, keep it safe. Grab a copy of Woodworking Masterclass on DVD and remember to keep it sharp, but more importantly, keep it safe and enjoy your woodwork.